just go ahead and get excited right now because it's going to be good. It's going to be good. I'm, I'm excited about it. Okay, check, check, okay. Got to get my mouth turned on. All right, tonight we're going to have a, a lesson on Nicodemus, okay? Now, you see my notes that I have in the highlighted spots? I'm going to spend about 30 minutes on each one of those. <laughs> that work? All right. Good. I'm glad y'all had a good supper. Okay. All right. I want to open us up with prayer tonight because I need it, and I think everybody else here needs it also. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time you've allowed us to come together and study your word, Lord. Lord, I pray for your spirit to come upon us, your spirit of discernment, so we can study your words and get closer to you, Lord. Be with those that have lost loved ones this week, those that are on our prayer list. We pray that you heal them if it be thy will, and that you touch them with a special touch, Lord. We say these things in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'm going to start out by reading our scripture, and then I'm going to go back and go on uh, different points that I have in the scripture. All right, our scripture comes from John chapter 3. 1 through 21. Is everybody familiar with this story of Nicodemus? That's all right. I'll make you aware of it tonight. That's <laughs> okay. All right. Nicodemus. It's going to be Ch John chapter 3, verse 1 through 21. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark, one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean, exclaimed <clears throat> Nicodemus, how can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and of, of the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but you can't tell where it's coming from or where it is going, so you cannot explain how people are born of the Spirit. How are these things possible? Nicodemus asked. Jesus replied, you are a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you do not understand these things. I assure you, we tell you what we, we have known and have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven and returned. But the Son of Man has come down from heaven, and as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on his pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. So everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his only 
one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it, for their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. Okay, first of all, do we all believe that all the words in the Bible are there for a purpose? Okay? When something's in the Bible, it's in there for a reason. So as we start our scriptures, it says there was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. Okay. Pharisees back then, they had two forms of, uh, they had the Pharisees and the Sadducees, okay? And they basically ruled from the temple, all right? It's kind of like we have today where we have the Democrats and the Republicans. Don't we wish that they ruled from the temple? Well, but they don't, okay? But they come together and they have the Sanhedrin. That's where the court takes place. Now, the Roman government was over Jerusalem at that time, okay? So they would take care of the business of the church, the temple, and Rome would take care of the city. If you'll remember when they wanted to crucify Jesus, they brought him to Pilate because they didn't have the authority to crucify. It had to be done through the Roman government. Okay, the Pharisees, something that you, they, they believed in the Mosaic Law, and the Mosaic Law was the Ten Commandments and many rules and religious observances that were given in the first five books of the Bible, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Okay, that was the Mosaic Law. And that's, that's one of the reasons why the Pharisees did not like Jesus or his disciples was because they didn't follow the Mosaic Law. Now, as we read, as I go through this, I want you to think about something. In the next verse, after dark, on one evening, he came to speak to Jesus. Now, he was a religious leader. He knew the Mosaic law, okay? But what did he call Jesus? He called him rabbi. What does rabbi mean? Teacher, okay? All right, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Now, before Jesus, there had been prophets. There had been judges, okay? What happened to most of the prophets that were sent before him? They killed most of them, okay? Okay. And the judges were there to try to help the Israelite people to do what they were supposed to do. Now, even in the first five books, it speaks of a Messiah that's coming. Okay? Why is it a Jewish leader who knew the Mosaic law did not recognize Jesus as being the Messiah? Okay? The prophets that had come before, they could do miraculous signs through God. God would do it through them, okay? Why was it that they didn't pick up on the fact that Jesus was the Messiah? Anybody got an answer for that? 
One of the things is, is they didn't want to. Okay? Once again, like we talked about at first, they were in power. If Jesus was to come in, he would take over their position. They wouldn't be in power anymore. All right? So that was one of the reasons they didn't want him. Now, also notice that when he come to Jesus, he come to him after dark. Why would he come to him after dark? He come to him after dark because he didn't want anybody to see him talking to Jesus. Okay? Now, he didn't want them to see him talking to him, and he called him teacher. All right? <clears throat> he did not also want God to know what he was doing either. Why is it that we think that God can't see what we're doing in the dark? Okay? I mean, we know that he knows all things, but for some reason we have it in our mind that in the dark, he can't see what we're doing. Yeah. Okay. Now, let's go to verse 3. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean? He exclaimed. What do you mean? Now, he's a teacher, okay? What do you mean? I have read, I've read through the Bible at least once, maybe twice, and it always amazes me when I come back to some scriptures, the stuff that you don't pick up on or what doesn't really... When I was studying this, born again just kind of got me. Almost like I was popped in the face about it, okay? If we don't have the resurrection, we don't have anything. That's right. We don't have anything. If God, if Jesus didn't resurrect then we don't have anything. We don't have anything if we're not born again either. Okay? You think about born again. All right. <clears throat> we, we talked about having the rabbi, him calling him teacher. He didn't understand the term born again. How can you go back into the womb? That's what he asked. That's not what Jesus was saying, okay? What, what happens when we're born again? We have, we have tendencies when we're, before we're born again, when we were sinning, we sinned without any thought about it, okay? Sin didn't bother you then because you didn't know there was any other way to live, Okay? So to be born again, you have to get away from that sinful nature. Uh, at my house, uh, I've told y'all before, we raise goats, okay? Right now, we got 16 babies on the ground, just running around everywhere, okay? These babies, when they're born, it's so fun to watch them because within the first 10 minutes, they will be on their feet, and shortly thereafter, they'll nurse their mother. And why is that? Because it's in their nature to do so. Okay? It's in their nature. Well, guess what? We have a sinful nature. Okay? We are born into it. We have a sinful nature. And when we are born, we don't quite stand up as quick as the baby goats do. <laughs> Okay, we do get there, all right, but we gravitate towards sin. Everything that we do, we gravitate towards sin. Think about this. When we have, uh, when we have problems, when we run into trouble or whatever, is it not most of the time the easiest thing for you to do is to do the wrong thing? Okay? Usually you feel like you get less consequences by doing the wrong thing. Well, that sounds like it because you're, 
you know, you're, you're gravitated towards sin, though. You have a sin nature. Okay, now let's go to verse 5. Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and of spirit. Humans reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to the spirit life. The Holy Spirit. And then back to our word born again. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it's going from or where it's come from or where it is going. This you cannot explain how people are born of the Spirit. Okay? How are these things possible? Nicodemus asked. Okay. Now, once again, he's a Jewish leader. He's, telling, he's supposed to be telling the people what they're supposed to know about the Bible. Okay? But he doesn't know what Jesus is talking about. Why is that? He's had the Word. He studied it. We talk about Pharisees. What did Saul, who became Paul, say about him being a Pharisee? He said he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, okay? Did he mean that as a compliment? No. No. No, he did not. How are these things possible? Nicodemus says, Jesus replied, you are a respected Jewish teacher. But yet he wasn't telling the people what they needed to hear. And yet you do not understand these things. How many times did Jesus talk to the Pharisees and put them in their place? Quite often, yes, very much so. Okay, and yet you don't understand these things. I assure you, we tell you that what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. What is our testimony? Okay? The life that you lived, what did Jesus say right here? What we know and what we have seen. All right? What we know in our life before we were saved, before we were born again, okay? And what we have seen that has taken place in our life. Each and every one of you has a testimony. You think that you don't have anything to talk to somebody about or witness about, but all of us have a testimony as to how we were before we were saved and the blessings that God has given us since we've been saved. We all have a testimony. All right. <clears throat> now, excuse me, I'm getting awful dry up here. Okay, now verse 12. But if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one, no one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. How many people went to heaven that you know of in the Bible that didn't pass through death's door? Two, all right? Okay, <clears throat> Enoch was one. That's in Genesis 5, 24. And who was the other one? There you go, Elijah. It's in 2 Kings 2 and 11. Those two were taken up without going through a physical death. All right. What did it say about Enoch? He walked close with God. He was close to God. All right. What about Elijah? Okay. Basically the same thing. Okay. 
And I get so, I, you talk about getting tongue-tied. When I'm trying to talk about Elijah and Elijah, I get all mixed up on those two. Okay? <laughs> all right. Now, but those are the two that went, they, they went to heaven. But what does it say about Jesus? But the Son of Man has come down from heaven. Okay? He went to heaven, and he's come down to heaven. All right? Now, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent, the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. All right. We talk about the bronze snake on a pole. That took place in Numbers 21, 6 through 9. If you'll remember, the Israelites, they come out of Egypt, okay? God led them out of Egypt. Those people sometimes, I think, are some of the most stubborn people there ever was, all right? But if you'll look around you, and my wife would probably say, you know, just as bad as they were, okay? I've always said that if God let me walk on dry ground, if he spread open the ocean and I walked on dry ground, that would hang with me just a little while. Wouldn't it you? But the Israelites, they griped about everything. Everything. Now, when the serpents come along was when they had... All right, God had supplied them with manna and quail. How long did God supply them with manna and quail? Forty years, okay? And that was like six days a week, and they held over for Sunday, okay? Can you imagine how much quail and manna it took? We're talking about somewhere around 2,000 people. I mean, can you imagine, or 2 million, excuse me, I said 2,000, didn't I? Two million people. I don't know how much quail and manna people can eat, but you think about that, okay? And what they were doing, they were griping about it because they hated that they had, all we got is this quail and this manna. Well, you know, you could have nothing, okay? But anyway, they were griping about that, and what happened was God sent some venomous snakes, okay? And these snakes bit the people, the Israelites, okay? And there were people that died from it, all right? And then they come crying to Moses, you know. And Moses prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him if he would put up a, a bronze head of a snake up on a pole in the middle of the camp, that when people got bit, they could look at the pole, okay, the snake on the pole, and they would be healed, correct, okay? Now, why is that important in what we're talking about now? Okay, it's because the Son of Man is going to have to be lifted up the same way. Okay, and just like they were healed when they looked at him, if they look upon God on the cross and ask for forgiveness, then they'll be healed, basically. Okay, they'll be healed. All right, now, verse 16. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Now, what are we talking about when we talk about perishing? They, they refer to when they go to hell, okay? Now, I'm going to say something that might not be real popular, but it's a true statement. When you're born, you're born with a first-class ticket to hell, okay? I've heard people all my life say, well, I don't have to make a decision. I don't have to make a decision now, or I can make it later, or whatever. I want you to understand something. When we do, we do have free choice, okay? But we do not have no choice. We make a choice, all right? If you don't make any choice, then you've already, your, your ticket's stamped, okay? You're going there. But if you believe in God and you're reborn, there's where the reborn comes in. You have to be a new person. 
You can't be the old person. All right? When you're reborn, you, you do away with your ticket to hell. Now you have a ticket to heaven. Okay? But you do have to do something. I had a cousin, and uh, he didn't have the best of life. His, uh, his mother and daddy separated. His mother married a man whose last name was uh, Six Killer. Have you ever heard of anybody named that? That was his, he was an Indian. He was named that, okay? They had a rough life growing up. Um, my brother called me. He had him on his heart real bad, and he wanted uh, me and his wife and my wife to go and talk to him. And we did. We went and witnessed to him. But you know what he said to us after we talked to him? He said, your God, your good God, won't send me to hell. Let me tell you something. God doesn't send anybody to hell. Okay? You send yourself. Yes. God, God doesn't send anybody to hell. And we, we talked to him and we witnessed to him, and that was his response. Your good God is not going to send me to hell. About three weeks after that, they found him laying dead on his bed. He had had a bad case of the shingles and some other, I, I forget what it was, some other things medically that was wrong with him. And his mother, he had called his mother, and his mother was going to come pick him up and take him to the hospital. And when she got there, he was laid out on the bed. He had had his pants pulled halfway up, and evidently he just, he was gone. Of course, you know, I always have the thought, you know, he could. He could have confessed his sins to God. He could have been saved. I don't know. I would have hoped that after us talking to him, that if that it would have taken place, he would have called us, you know. But how many times have you had somebody to pass away and you just, you wonder why you didn't have that conversation with them, okay? And you can even have that conversation with them just like we did. But it's not, you don't save people. God saves people, okay? You're supposed to do what God wants you to do and let him take it from there, okay? You're the vessel in which he goes through. You, he, you, put, that, you put that message in their head, okay? But God takes care of the salvation. You're just supposed to witness. We talked about that a little bit in men's Bible study uh, last night about... Uh, predestination you know some people get all upset about that when you talk about predestination let me tell you something god knows everything okay is it unreasonable to think that god knows before anybody's born if they're going to be saved or not that doesn't mean that god says okay this one's going to be saved there's no it's not that god wants all people to be saved okay but he knows who's going to be and who's not going to be. And I've heard people say, well, then why should we pray about it? And why should we witness to people if God knows who's going to be saved and who don't? Think about it. You might be the vessel in which he's going through to reach that person. You don't know. Nobody knows, okay? Basically, what I'm telling you is do your job, Okay? Do your job and let God take care of that, okay? Let God take care of who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved, okay? Now, <clears throat> let me see where I was at. I can get off track easy. Okay, God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. What does that mean? The blood of Jesus washes away all the sins. His blood has washed away all the sins from the past, all the sins up till now, and in the future. Okay? 
but we still have to ask God for forgiveness, okay? But his blood has washed it all away, okay? There is no judgment for the ones that believe in him, all right? That's right. That's right. Your name is in the book. All right. But anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. Like I said, you will make a choice if you make no choice. You've made a choice. Okay. All who do evil, well, let me say this. God, okay, God's light came into the world, but people love the darkness. You know what I call the darkness? The devil's playground. Because we are a group of believers in our church group, not church house, the body of believers of the church, okay? But when we leave these doors, we enter into the devil's playground, okay? I'm sorry. That's the way it is. All right. <clears throat> More than the light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near. It is, <clears throat> it is for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right go to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. Okay? Now tonight, I want to say... That we have, um, all right, as we all are aware, we had a dear sister in Christ whom we knew as Kayla entered the gates of heaven this week. Kayla, no doubt, has heard the words that we all long to hear. What are those words? Well done, you good and faithful servant. I long to hear those words, okay? It is, <clears throat> excuse me, we talked about testimony. It's Kayla's testimony that in her last days, she was sharing the news of the Lord through playing and listening to gospel music. When she could no longer speak of this goodness of God, Kayla shared the news of our Lord until she met the Lord. Kayla knew that it was her time for her to meet God, yet her concern was for others. Her words to use were, <clears throat> and I quote, you can either be with him or against him, but he is still God, okay? And what I would like to do is I would like for all of y'all, if you would, to come and approach the stage. And I would like for Mr. Mike Warner here to give us a prayer tonight for Kayla's family and for us because we have to live without her also. Okay? If you would, sir, please. Huh? Yep. Oh, okay. In a somber way for Kayla, Lord, tonight. But Lord, we come to you, some hurting more than others over this, but yet help us to remember that we should be rejoicing because of the life that Kayla led. 
Lord, I pray that you will strengthen each and every one of friends and family, Lord, that you will give us your blessed your blessed shalom, your peace, Lord, that because you are the God of peace, the Jehovah Shalom, and we know that, Lord, but, and those of us that don't, Lord, I pray that you will touch our hearts to where we, we know that you give the whole peace. Lord, I pray that as the days go by, Lord, that the longing that, that will be in some hearts, Lord, will, that you will comfort them, that, that, that only you can comfort us the way that we need to at this time, Lord. I pray, Lord, that your spirit will flow, and those that Kayla touched, it will open hearts, open minds to, to understand, Lord, that you are the great I am. You are the Holy One that you are the one that that when there are sores and hurts, Lord, that, you, that you're the one that applies the balm of Gilead to us. Lord, that you're the one that comforts us in our time of hurt, that you're the one that brings the joy in the morning. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us will trade in our ashes and we will trade in our sorrows for the joy that comes from knowing that one day we'll get to see and, and hug the neck of Kayla again, Lord. That we'll get to know her as she knows you now. And that we'll get to know you all the more. Lord, I pray that your strength be with Kayla's family, the ones that are still here, Lord. On both sides, Lord, with Corey and her, Lord, that, that give them strength, Lord, to, to look up and see tomorrow coming because there is a new day tomorrow. Strengthen them. Give them hope because, Lord, you are the hope. And, and there's a lot of her family that knows you, Lord. I pray that they will use this as a, as a way to strengthen their belief and their and their and their love of you, Lord, that, that she's with you, that they can come see her again. Guide these guide the friends that's here, Lord, that 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 we would have enough compassion in our hearts to to strengthen the family, Lord, and strengthen us as we as we do this. We love you. We give you all the praise, worship, and honor, Lord. Be with us as we go through the rest of the evening, as we see the friends and family tomorrow. Lord, and I pray that as, as Kyle brings the word tomorrow, Lord, that, that you will quicken his heart, Lord, that you will give him the strength because he was also a, fam, uh, a friend, a deep friend, Lord, that, that you will strengthen him in this, Lord, that that he will have the right words at the right time for the right person to say, Lord, and that you will get the glory in all of this. Lord, I pray that you'll comfort him. I, I don't know that I could do the service with, with as close a friend as they was. Lord, strengthen him and, and, and let him know that you have your arms around him also, just like the rest of the family. We love you, and we praise you, and give you the glory, and in your name we pray, amen. amen.